Welcome to Stitchery Stories, where textile artists share their life in fabric and thread. Inspiration, techniques, disasters and delights. And I'm Susan Weeks, enthusiastic embroiderer and textile arts dabbler who also loves podcasting. So take a break and enjoy our light-hearted chat and please share with your friends so they can enjoy it too. Hello and welcome today to our lovely guest, Amanda Cobbett. Hi, Amanda. Hi, Sue. It's brilliant to speak to you today, and I know we've got lots of exciting things to look forward to. So I've got Amanda's bio here. So in her own words, Amanda Cobbett is an award-winning textile artist. Her artistic talent is embedded in her DNA, passed down from generations of seamstresses, engineers, and draftsmen. An ability to visualize in 3D and to deftly turn a sketch into an object is a skill that Amanda has inherited and which is manifest in her work today. These attributes, together with her love of mark making, are the basis from which each piece, of, each piece of work is created. During her daily dog walk, Amanda scours the understory of the forest floor, seeking its hidden treasures, photographing and collecting fallen debris. Back at the studio, she draws with the sewing machine needle into a dissolvable fabric, and by building up layers of thread, creates a new fabric that she moulds into a textile copy of the natural world. Machining approximately 130,000 individual stitches a day. Have you counted every one of those, Amanda? Absolutely. <laughs> Amanda's creations are not only a textile tour de force, but are educational, highlighting the beauty and diversity that exists in the undergrowth. With a sense of fun, each unique piece of work is displayed in a contemporary form of the Victorian display case, allowing the work to be wall hung and viewed from all angles. Brilliant. I really, really enjoy that. <laughs> right, now there's, there's a quote here. Do you, want me to, do you want me to say this quote? Yeah, if you like. Right, so we've got this quote here as well. An artist who shares a little of themselves, their passion, inspiration and knowledge to create a piece of handmade work which has an authenticity of soul is immeasurable. Well, I think that's a lovely quote, actually. Where's that from? Well, that's me. That's, that's my you. quote. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. I just feel the import that that it sums it up for me that if you you're making something you're using all your skills and your knowledge um, that and you're translating that into a piece of work that someone else can appreciate then I think that's that is immeasurable it it, it absolutely is so I, I really like that actually and I love that it's from you as well so thank yeah. you for that so now then before we get to engross in your stitchery story today Would you like to share with us what you are working on and what has got you excited? Well, I am working on at the moment a whole raft of commissions um, that I took on from my very successful first Chelsea Flower Show. I am incredibly busy again. There's been no rest for me. I was hoping that I might get a week off (laughs) after the show, but no, no, no. I am busy beavering away again back in the studio. So obviously you would be busy beavering away, creating a body of work to display at Chelsea, and then now, I was, so yeah, yeah and, and has that has that all sold? I, yes, it has. So I spent um, from last November until May, up until almost the very last moment, <laughs> creating um, eighty five pieces of work, which is a huge amount for me. That's usually a year's worth of work, and I managed wow. to squeeze it into six months. Wow. Um, for the show so I knew that I wanted at least that amount of work and mm-hmm. and that would mean I, I would have still have very little stock um so I think I had about 65 pieces on the wall and, and 20 in stock um mm-hmm. and amazingly of those 85 pieces only three came home so um really exciting but also slightly <laughs> stressful at the same time knowing that um I could sell them that quickly within a week I could well actually within about three days yeah um, they'd they'd been sold so so very exciting but also um quite overwhelming but but the reaction to the work something that you're probably that I um although I've heard people's comments before about the work um to have them in a in a constant stream of of people coming coming to see me Mm -hmm. 
was was it, it was very overwhelming really yeah and I think overwhelming is probably a really good word for that because it, probably exhausting is another one but that sounds a bit negative doesn't it but it just yeah <laughs> well, I think you're just running on adrenaline the yeah. whole time yeah. Yeah. and um and of course everybody that comes to the, to see the work or most people that come they haven't they haven't seen my work before so they're looking at it with fresh eyes and yes. and I think also they're not quite sure what they're seeing mm. so um so lots and lots of questions um and a lot of the same question <laughs> are being asked but you know to me the whole time and of course they 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 don't know the answer so I'm giving them the answer like like it's the first time I've ever said it yes yes <laughs> so, so exhausting from that point of view but um you know it, really exciting that that people are uh, we're, we're really loving the work now and at this point I just wanted to say that go get yourself off and go and find Amanda so I will do the links because I had nearly forgotten but anyway I was going to say something else but here we are links right so you need to go and see amandacobbett.com Amanda and Cobbett is C-O-B-B-E-T-T uh, she's also on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest. All of Amanda's links will be on her episode of stitcherystories.com. Um, but what you really need to understand is what we're talking about here, which is 3D textile mushrooms and lichen and pieces of wood. I don't think we've said that really, have we? I know we talked about scouring, scouring the understory of the forest floor. But uh, yeah, so, and they do look real this is like when I was speaking with Janine last week about her you know portraits of the orangutan and the chimpanzee they're looking at you you could you could reach out and hug them and stroke them and and yours looks the same so I'm sure for people therefore who are at a you know an an exhibition an event all around flowers and gardening and the, the kind of natural world as it were to be then faced with what looks like real mushrooms in cases what what was the reaction there? I should imagine, yeah, quite confused in some respects because people won't understand. I th- absolutely. I think people that were walking past the stand um, could see my my name and the fact it said embroidered nature. Yeah. Um, but were doing a double take because they couldn't they they couldn't get their heads around actually what it was or what it is that they they're seeing. Yes. And um, so so people would come on and no, oh, I don't even, they, do, they wouldn't even, I don't even know if they saw the embroidered nature bit, but they would come onto the stand and say, how are you preserving the pieces? <laughs> which, is a, which is such a lovely, yeah. you know, I feel like my mm. job is done. <laughs> yeah. that I might have preserved something or someone else asked how they were going to get the, would, would they have a problem at customs getting the work home? Oh. They thought that the mushrooms were real yeah. and, oh. um, or had I had I um, put them in resin, or and, and I think it's the look on someone's face when you say, "Well, well no, they're not real. That it's embroidery." Yeah. They, they're still even more well confused, confused by it. <laughs> like, what have you done? Have you have you embroidered onto some bark, or have you embroidered over a mushroom? And then when I tell them that it is just essentially paper and thread, they they. They just can't get their head around it because you always assume or imagine that an embroidery is a two-dimensional thing. Yes. And as soon as you take it into a three-dimension, they they don't really understand how that can happen. Um, it's all it's all very magic and lovely. So, I think it it does show testament though to the ability that you've evolved, and I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about this in in techniques in creating those pieces so they do look so realistic that people you know assume as you were just walking past in some kind of garden show oh there's a lot of mushrooms in there what how what, that's interesting how are they preserved etc cetera, etc cetera. Yeah. so when you really I suppose investigate very close up but even then I mean the photos I've seen you, you still can't really tell mind you I do have bad eyesight but still <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so it's and people have got that preconceived idea about if they have any idea about what embroidery is too um yeah. so yeah so I can imagine it's actually quite intriguing as well yeah and I think I think a lot of people perhaps think that 
you know, they read embroidery and they automatically assume embroidery is hand embroidery and not machine mm. embroidery. Yeah. And that's another question. This must take you hundreds and hundreds of hours mm. of work. And then you sort of say, well, I, I, I make them on a sewing machine. Then they still can't get their head around it. You know, <laughs> am I using a computer program? <laughs> How am I? Is it a 3D printer? You know, all these questions, you, as soon, you know, you're saying no to everything. No, no, it's none of those things. And they, they just can't, they can't work it out. And I, you know, I try to explain that I embroider everything flat. I embroider everything, a lot of onto a dissolvable fabrics, which I can then um, heavily embroider and then wash away the dissolvable fabric. So I can then mold what I've got left into the shape that I want it. Um but they, because it, it's a really alien thing to them, they, mm. they, it, it's hard. To, I suppose if you if you don't know about embroidery techniques, it's hard to get get your head around. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, I think it's absolutely fascinating. It really, really is. Yeah, so before we spend all of our time talking about your Chelsea experience, as fascinating as it was, <laughs> um, what what got you on the path to creating, you know, realistic fungi? What what got you on that path, Amanda? Um, well, I was always been interested in, um, botanical illustration. And, um, when I was, I trained as a, a printed textile designer at, uh, Chelsea College of Art. And I loved doing that. But, and as a student, I had access to the Natural History Museum Library and Q Library. Ooh, yeah. uh, so I was able to go and look at lots of stuff that I, anything I wanted really yeah. and, and, and are quite often things that that aren't available for the public to see so it was a real privilege yeah and um I suppose make doing the things that I do now is sort of a, a manifestation I suppose of, of lots of lots of things that I've been interested in through my life and that have all come together as this this body of work that I'm now creating yeah but um at Q, they have an incredible mycology department. Um, and as a student, you go there and you think, oh, this is very exciting. I'm going to go and look at a load of uh, interesting specimens of, yeah. of mushrooms and things. But of course, when you get there and everything's wrapped up and beautifully preserved in, in, in these uh, paper sheets, and then what they're sort of unveiled, what, what you're left with or what you see is a rather disappointing, shriveled up specimen <laughs> of, of something that, that used to be beautiful. <laughs> Died many years ago. <laughs> exactly. And, and oh. of course, of course, that's going to happen because yes. things can't last forever. Yeah. But, but actually, they, they once were beautiful. And, and quite often, the reason I, that I love my subject is because I live in the in, in the forest. Um, I walk every day with a dog. All these things are accessible to me. Yes. And um, although I don't pick the mushrooms, I do photograph them because for that very reason that they don't last. And yes. I don't need I don't need to pick the mushrooms. Um, but but they are still very very beautiful, and I feel that that beauty should be celebrated. And um, and it's a, it's they are they're a fascinating subject to study yeah i think they are and yeah it's, you look at some of the well, even where it's just you know, like walking and hiking and you know autumn time you see loads of lovely ones don't you and you think wow it's bright red and orange and all the different colors and then as you say then to get the specimen out like, oh, it's like a shivered up black thing <laughs> yeah <laughs> not very exciting so yeah i think it's 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 really nice how you've brought them kind of kept them alive really in, in that respect. Yeah, I, I'd like to think that what I'm doing is a sort of recording of of specimens, um, you know, like a documenting the documentation of rather of of specimens that perhaps, you know, the things that I can find locally or wherever it is I'm walking. And they might not be here in however many years time, hundred years time, mm. but with l- any luck, what I'm doing could be to think that I might be able to create a little piece of history is is really exciting. Yeah, I think it is. And as you say, they'll be all over the place now, your works. And if people are talking about getting them through customs, then they've obviously gone abroad as well. So how exciting is that? Yeah. Yes, I'm really lucky to have, have the pieces all over the world now. So, yes, a little bit of me has, <laughs> has spread far and wide. 
<laughs> like a like a like a fun guy does. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Brilliant. So, can I just talk to you then about? So you've you've had this you know this ability to make something into a three D object, and you really like nature and fungi. So how how did you go about recreating? these pieces especially when you're looking at the pieces of wood that look like with lichen and, and those sorts of things on how how have you involved those techniques i'm sure everyone's fascinated to find out oh well it's 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 really experimentation i i never follow a set formula so therefore i'm never disappointed with the outcome yeah, because well. <laughs> set formula and i think that's really liberating yeah so for the for the lichen and the moss and the bark i can find and pick up those those specimens and, and bring them back to the studio because they do last a little bit longer in there yes. they're there on the forest floor I'm not removing them against their will mm-hmm. and just to be able to explore those and study them you know my hands looking at them and then try and then working out a way of how I might be able to recreate those and and the same machine was seemed like a, a natural progression in my work the tool that I wanted to use yes. to, to to make them work and, and I think particularly with these subjects because they are so textural so beautiful beautiful that it works really well I mean if I was to take flowers or something that was very soft and delicate for me it wouldn't work I could I don't think I could make it work it's because these things are so beautifully textural but I think they lend themselves to embroidery yeah, it's it's a way of putting down a layer of colour and texture, isn't it? Which are then yeah. fine. So to make like the the stalks, for example, are they stuffed like a stuffed material? No. So so on the on the fungi, the stalks are a paper mache base, oh, right. um, which I then cover with a very fine silk and then add all the little embellishments by hand afterwards and that just gives it a little bit of rigidity but the the caps and the the gills are all self-supporting embroidery so they're not stuffed with anything Ah. it allows me to either sew into it if I have put a layer Mm. of fabric over the top I can either sew into it or burn into it it's building up little layers that I can then take away or add to if I need to but the, but adding a tiny bit of fine silk just allows me to to do that because it's very difficult to sew into a hard mm. paper mache yes added a bit of silk over the top you can actually um, work into it a bit and you do have a really nice video as well there's two films on my website one with me talking and one <laughs> not not a how-to but with me with me talking about my work and another one the newest one which is just got music it shows some different techniques and and how I'm doing it so is there any particular technique that you've evolved with that you you just love because it, it works so well with with what you're doing well, sewing onto dissolvable fabric yeah. is always an experiment. I do the stitches. I change all the time in order to get to get the shapes because obviously if you're just doing a straight running stitch backwards and forwards, you're mm. not necessarily going to be able to mould that very easily into a lovely curve of the top of a, of a fungi. So experimenting with that. But when I was working in printed textiles, I did some work in homewares and they used to give me a shape of, of say, a bowl or a, or a plate. Yeah. Um, and then I would have to do my design around that. So lots of different curved shapes. So I can work from that. I could work out how I know how to make a cap or a curved shape. You know, a chanterelle mushroom, which is got this lovely tube shape to mm. it. Um, so that has helped me be able to work out how to formulate different shapes. So, yeah, you, you said earlier on about everything's led to this point where you've now created this body of work. And, yeah, I can, I can see that. There's, there's been a lot of evolution in there, hasn't there? Trial and error. Absolutely. Everything, everything that I've done, mm. done from, I think, from when I was at school till every, every little thing that I can think of that has led me to here, that has, everything has helped me from, you know, the time I was doing my GCSEs. I studied textile design. I think I was probably the most challenging <laughs> student in the class. Not because I was naughty, because I was never naughty, but I never followed the same formula as everybody else. I was off 
doing my little experiment. Where Pushing the boundaries, I think. I did all the time, all the time. And I think my horrified, very strict textile teacher, um, I think was probably quite glad to get rid of me uh, <laughs> when I was making the giant burger cushion and everyone else was making a lovely appliqued cushion and I had lettuce and tomatoes and a giant burger. Oh, do you know, I've just rem- that's just reminded me. So I did, obviously I did O levels because I'm older and um, we did, I did art and design, but you could do it as textiles. Mm-hmm. So, so not many people did it, but there was a little handful of us. And I remember, so I was always the one making the, these mad things. So we, we had to do a cushion. So I decided I was making a jellyfish. So it, so it was a, a tied, um, you know, tie-dyed pink, I think it was, it will have been, tie-dyed pink material that I then kind of like, you know, gathered up, loosely stuffed it so it was floppy, and then did all its dangly bits, was all bits of wool and, and anything I could find really to make its thing. So everybody else had these like nice, neat and tidy embroidered cushions that looked like shops or whatever. And then there, there was me with this like random jellyfish. And then there was another thing we had to do, which was I, I did a big quilt, uh, yeah, a big quilt cover. So side of a single bed quilt cover in calico or something. And then I, I got three or four different colours of velvet. I think that was something like pink, turquoise, purple, them kind of colours. And then did something inspired by a big mushroom, uh, you know, big fungi on the top <laughs> of it. I sprayed the background. So every lunchtime I'd nip into the studio and spray another bit of pink or blue or whatever it was on there. So it was all mottled and sprayed. And then I appliqued on and kind of half stuffed these enormous fungi type shapes and everyone was going what the hell are you doing well I've made this quilt cover out of a fungi out of velvet you can imagine what it looked like (laughs) so there we are I think it's so good to experiment though (laughs) that's what you need to do because you have to that's your opportunity school and college and university your opportunity to to try all these crazy experiments do you know what it taught me though it taught me she taught me about finish and quality of finish and as much as I think she was sort of you know deploring my stupid burger that I was desperate to make she did make me finish it properly and and that was a really valuable lesson and although after doing my my GCSE textiles I thought I'm never going to do textiles again because because of her strict way and I just thought how how can I ever make this work yeah um what she did what she did teach me was quality of finish and I just and I think that was really important because I feel now when I'm making my work it's the thing always in my mind that this has got to be the absolute best that I can make it be otherwise what's the point in doing it for me that's my that's how I feel about it I need to make it the best I can I can possibly make it so there we are excellent lessons from school marvelous (laughs) so we've you know, mentioned there about Chelsea. No, I mean, I ask, you know, what's been the high point of your textile art and embroidery journey so far? So I'm, I'm guessing possibly Chelsea. Um, there've been lots of highlights, been loads of highlights. Yeah. And I've been very lucky to have worked in textiles for the last 25 years. Yes. So there've been some amazing things that, that I feel that I've done that I'm very proud of. But I think the thing that I feel most proud of is when I meet people and talk about my work and to see their reactions and then for them to buy it is so thrilling if someone wants to buy a piece of my work and is going to love looking at it and enjoying it as much as I've loved making it then that is an absolute highlight for me and nothing is better than that yeah it's it's that brilliant thing of when somebody says yes I want to buy it and you go woohoo and do a happy dance I do the same yeah. when I get you know people approach me online oh will, will you do some work for me yes woohoo <laughs> Yeah, it's it's so lovely that people want to enjoy it as as well as you've enjoyed it. Right then, Amanda, after all those uh, exciting highlights we've been talking about, do you have any stories when something didn't go quite as planned and was even considered a bit of a disaster? And importantly, what did you learn from that experience? Well, I think I could say that I haven't really had any major disasters Ooh. or any disasters Ooh. because I approach everything as an experiment. So Uh, if I'm not disappointed (laughs) if something doesn't quite go according to plan, then it's not a disaster. (laughs) When I start something, I have no set formula about how I think it might end up. I know I want it to look like the piece of work or the real piece that I've got in front of me. 
but I don't think, oh, I've got to do this formula, I've got to do it like that in order for it to work. And I think there's always a solution to a problem. And sometimes when I get a bit stuck with something, that's my time to go out and walk the dog mm. and think it over. And, and walking is is so good for that. I, I walk for about two hours every day with the dog. And um, that's my time to to think through a solution. And if I think, if I'm really stuck on it, I might I might leave it for a week and and quite often I've got maybe two or three things on the go at the okay. same time. Yeah. Um, but I always come back to something. I always finish something. If you think that you're in danger of working something to death, then just step away from it and and come back to it another time when you when you can look at it with fresh eyes. And and I have pieces. I had a piece that I was working on a few months ago. It was it was almost finished, but it wasn't quite there. And I, mm-hmm. I don't, for a long time I didn't know how to resolve it. And it wasn't. I wasn't cross with it. It was fine. I yeah. just needed to not deal with it until I really had to. And actually, when I came back to it and fiddled about with it a bit more, it, it turned out really well. And it ended up being one of my favourite pieces. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think that's a really good attitude. And last week when I was speaking with Janine, she mentioned something similar about, oh, well, you know, disaster, if something's gone a bit wrong, well, I just go over it again. So it, it isn't really such a thing as a disaster either. And then somebody on Instagram had commented at what, a previous guest who has a bit of a nightmare doing machine embroidery, Annie. She, she, she sent me a message saying, oh, I'm, I'm going to try again. And um, I was really heartened by um, what Janine was saying. I'll, I'll just go over it again. I said, right, there you are then. No disasters, it's going to work out perfectly. Yeah. Well, I think people find somebody else saying, well, hang on a minute, don't worry, go over it again or... It depends on the sort of work as well, of course, isn't it? But um, mm. yeah, I, th- I think we can reterm what we think in in terms of a disaster. Yeah, I think the thing is with the machine embroidery that I do, and I would very much call myself the accidental embroiderer. Because, <laughs> oh, like um, it was never, it wasn't my profession. I'm not, I'm not trained in embroidery. It's all an experiment. I've made it up. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, because there's no set formula, then then it's not going wrong ever. Yeah, no, I, I really, really like that approach. So therefore, I suppose, I think you've said you've finished most things. I don't suppose you've got any UFOs to make us laugh, have you? <laughs> well, there is <laughs> one thing that um, I, I have a very lovely admin assistant who now I've had to employ to help me out because I can't find it very hard to switch from admin to, yes. to creative. There is this Spanish commission, which we we lovingly call the Spanish Inquisition, (laughs) has been going on for about eight months. And the reason it's going on so long is because the client is very particular about what he wants. And he's very lovely, but... I'd sort of say to him, you know, that's not going to really work together. And I want to have some input. And really what I've done is I've let him have a little bit too much input. Uh, And hmm. and regrettably, I'm now in this position where things keep changing. And I'm never going to do that again. I'm just going to put my foot down next time and say, no, you can't have that. Um, But it's very hard because you want to try and please, you want someone to have what they want. But also, if they don't, really know what works together and you do it's very hard to then backtrack yes yeah so yeah the Spanish Inquisition which I started (laughs) I did a bit yesterday to it and Sarah my assistant will be delighted that I've almost finished it because I think she asks me probably every week how every week I think that's it getting on (laughs) and um it is almost finished I'm at the root stage of (laughs) getting it all done so I would be really glad when that gets posted off and then I can work on all these other commissions that I've got, which I promise won't take as long yeah. as this one has. I think it's a, a lesson learned. It's about boundaries, isn't it? It is. And I didn't, yeah. I didn't, this dear chap, I didn't really give him any boundaries and I wished I had, or yeah. I wished I'd just said, no, you, you yeah. can't have that. Yeah, it doesn't it's work. not going to work. Yeah, exactly. And, and that is so, it is so hard. And it, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about textiles, embroidery, my online work, it's still the same thing. You have to view it that you're the expert in this particular thing. Somebody wants you to make that thing for them to, because they like how you do it. And again, it doesn't matter what you're talking about, but we have to manage the process and we have to lovingly set boundaries so that it will be a success. You know, it might sound awful, but the client doesn't know what they don't know. And so you can be badly led astray by trying to be too accommodating and and I think it 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 behoves us to set those boundaries 
for the sake of quality and the yeah. relationship and everything else. Well, I'm, I'm really pleased that it's nearly coming to an end for you <laughs> and it won't turn into a UFO. <laughs> It will not. I will not <laughs> allow it to turn into a UFO. There's nothing else here that that has not been done. It is only this these nine lovely little mushrooms and fungi <laughs> that, that just need to go to their forever home very soon. <laughs> So now, just as we start to kind of wrap up today, I just want to come back to organising your creative time. So you mentioned there that you have an admin assistant to help you. So that's quite interesting because not a lot of artists who I've spoke to have gone down that route, maybe as yet. So how how is that working for you? And how are you finding it's helping you to be creative in the time that you have? Oh, it's it's an absolute godsend. I would be, I always say, to, I always say I'll be back in February if you know, still doing what mm. I was doing then if I didn't have the help. And yeah. I know that not everyone, it's not viable for everybody yes. to to have someone to help them. But I've got to the stage now with my work that I've I've got so much to do that I I can't I I just can't switch off yes and, yes and and start doing admin that would take me the whole day whereas actually it would take Sarah maybe I don't know a couple of hours to yes do yeah. what, what I could do in that time because because she's good at it and she can do it and and it just allows me the time it's given me a huge amount of time to be able to be creative and and and, and not deal have to deal with the barrage of of emails and mm. inquiries yeah but, as lovely as it is to personally respond to everybody and I like to try and you know make it a nice experience for everybody um really I wouldn't I wouldn't get any work done if I was if I was doing that all day so um it was another lovely artist that's that recommended to me to because she had an assistant mm. and I thought oh I, crikey can I can I possibly not to do that myself but actually it's it works really well and my assistant she loves hand embroidery so she knows she understands the business mm -hmm. yeah. and um, she's also an incredible horticulturalist so she helps with the Chelsea stand and so so for us it's it works really really well yeah. um, and I don't know quite what I'd do without her so she's not allowed to go and find another <laughs> job <laughs> So, yes, a, a, a wise business decision and these things are, you know, ultimately we have to look at the business side of things as well. So, yeah, yeah. there's no point in, in slogging your guts out if you can't, you, you have to, you can't be every man and, and, and you okay. want, you need to, you need to be able to promote yourself on, on social platforms. You need to be, a, people need to know where you are, how they can see your work and, and and that is a that's a massive job in itself and if you want to grow as a business then then you can't really be expected to do everything no no you absolutely can't and yes it all then becomes a, a circle doesn't it so spent time spent on promoting marketing social media done the correct way then starts to grow your influence you get more opportunities um, so yeah it just becomes a, a circle doesn't it that grows upward instead of going downward yeah, yeah I was really interested to you know, just look at the, the business aspect of that in terms of now you have more creative time because you've got rid of the admin side of things well done difficult decisions it was it is a difficult decision handing over control and allowing someone else to be making those decisions for you but I think if you can get the balance right I know maybe perhaps it's the next stage of business for, for a lot of other people, but it's not, this isn't a hobby. This is, yeah. this is a, a, a business that earns money as well as being a lovely thing that I can, that I can do. Yeah. Um, you have to be realistic about it and what you can do in the time that you have to do it. Well, that's been brilliant. Thank you for sharing that with us, Amanda. Now, as we wrap up here, so future plans and projects, I know you said you've got a pile of commissions to get on with now. So is there any other kind of little highlights you want to share with us just as we wrap up today? Yes, I am doing this lovely exhibition in January at Somerset House. Mm -hmm. 
um, which has been curated by Francesca Gavin, and it's called Mushrooms, the Art and Design and Future of Fungi. Ooh. It's a collection of artists and writers and poets and scientists where, who have all collaborated to make this incredible exhibition. So, And Somerset House is such an incredible venue. Mm. So that's a real exciting thing to, to look forward to. And, of course, there's next year's Chelsea, which... Um, are you going for it then, are you? <laughs> I am, yeah. um, for my sins. <laughs> Um, I've decided that it's it's such a great show and it's a really good platform for me to show my work. It's a lovely fit, isn't it, for you? It, it really is. It's just such a lovely show. Um, and I need to start working on that in no, from November. Yes. So actually, I've, I'm busy really for the next year and then we'll see what happens after, after May next year. Yeah. Um, whatever I decide to do next. Wow. So just in a nutshell there, not to minimise this, one appearance for three three or four days at Chelsea kept you busy for six months preparing for it. It's going to keep you busy for a number of months afterwards in commissions and then you're back around the circle again. Wow. Yeah. 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 Keep, keep it simple. Someone said to me once um, about Chelsea that you can earn a, a year's worth of money in one week and I didn't believe it. But actually... It is possible for me just doing one show. If I all I need to do is one show, and I can show show my work and to one hundred seventy thousand people uh, in one shot over one week, then that suits me absolutely fine. Although it is really good to do other things as well and do exhibitions. And um, I have a gallery that takes the work in Cambridge who have supported me for the last five years, so I am actually loyal to them as well. But yes, yeah, it's, it's it's lovely to know that that as hard work as it is doing a big big show, um, you can reap the rewards from it. Yeah, great, and I'm sure lots of people will be very inspired by your experience as well. So there we are. Do you know what, Amanda? It's been absolutely fascinating speaking to you. I absolutely love the work that you create. I love those all those different fungi. They're just brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for spending your time with us today sharing your story with us and everybody go and find Amanda on her website and Instagram and everywhere else. Thank you so much. It's been absolutely wonderful speaking to you, Amanda. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Sue. Bye. Bye. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, then please join the Stitchery Stories fan club so you can get an email when a new episode is released. It's a quick and easy way of listening and of keeping up with any news and information around this podcast please visit stitcherystories.com. Of course, you can listen to Stitchery Stories on plenty of podcast apps at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify and plenty more besides. You can also ask your smart speaker to play Stitchery Stories podcast too. But wherever you listen, why not leave us a rating and a review to encourage other people to listen too. I very much appreciate you taking the time to do that for me. So that is the end of our Stitchery story for today. Keep stitching, keep smiling and keep creating your very own Stitchery stories.